Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the lecture recording. Today is going to be on unit three, which is the respiratory system. As a reminder, this is not a required assignment or activity for you to complete. Just viewing this um, lecture recording is totally optional and hopefully is just here to, to supplement what you are already reading in the textbook. And as a reminder, you don't need to watch this because none of the quiz or exam questions are based off of this material specifically, all right? If you just read the textbook chapters that are posted on Moodle, you can absolutely get an A in this class. Hopefully this will help just connect some dots. Maybe you just wanna hear from me. Maybe you want a little bit of extra information, okay? But please don't study this material that I'm talking about today as if this is the only material you need to, to pass the class or as if this is required, okay? This is just for your benefit. Hopefully you're benefiting. Anyway, let's do a screen share so you can see what I'm seeing. All right, so this is the respiratory system. The outline of today is as follows. So we'll talk about the functions of the respiratory system. We'll talk about what, what is breathing and why do we do it. We'll talk about the structures of the respiratory tract. We'll talk about ventilation and perfusion, and then we'll end with chemical control of breathing. Right. So the functions of the respiratory system, first and foremost, are gas exchange. And we'll talk about that in the next slide specifically, but that's bringing air into the blood from the lungs and then moving that blood with all the oxygen to the different cells of the body so they can create ATP and then getting rid of carbon dioxide in a sort of the reverse process. The respiratory system is also important because it helps filter our air. So when we breathe in air to use, we actually have to be able to trap dirt and particles and things like that. So structures like our nose hair and just the sort of convoluted shapes of, being, of inside of our skull and the different sinuses help with uh, trapping different things that we don't want, and mucus and stuff like that. We can also regulate the temperature and the water content of the air that we inhale. We can produce a voice, we can sing or we can speak like I'm doing now. As I'm exhaling, the air is going through my vocal cords and my larynx and producing sound. When I want to smell, we inhale air and it goes past sensory receptors in the, um, the olfactory system and it sends signals to our brain and lets us know what we're smelling. And then we can actually regulate pH of blood by, can, by basically not getting rid of enough carbon dioxide or getting rid of uh, excess carbon dioxide. So what is breathing? So respiration has two main components, okay? So ventilation, which is the mechanical portion of breathing, that's just sucking air in and pushing air out, basically expanding your lungs and then pushing it back and then contracting them, right? So this, this is basically the conduction of gas in through your nose and mouth down into the lungs and then back out. And because of that, every single organ in the respiratory system um, is partaking in that action. Now perfusion, on the other hand, that is different. That is moving the air from your lungs that you inhaled actually into your blood through the little capillaries that surround the alveoli and then moving that blood to all the different cells of your body so they can use the oxygen and then they can get rid of their carbon dioxide. Now, usually ventilation and perfusion are about equal. For as much air as you take in, you wanna do something with, right? But in some disease states, especially people who have respiratory disease, they can have what's called ventilation perfusion mismatch, which means that maybe they're breathing in plenty of air, what would they, you think they are, because they're doing this. <sighs> at a normal rate, a normal depth, things like that. But what's happening, or I should say what's not happening is the air that's going into their lungs isn't actually getting into their blood or it's not being transported to the cells that need the air or the carbon dioxide isn't coming back to the lungs from those cells. So there's not actually a match that's occurring. Now perfusion only occurs in the lungs. There's no other place in the respiratory tract that air molecules are actually leaving going into the blood. The only place that that happens is in the lungs, are in the lungs. So why do we breathe? First and foremost, people ask all the time, why exactly do we breathe? And it's not because our lungs need something or because 
some other part of our consciousness breathes it or needs it. It's because all the different cells in our body require oxygen in order to break down glucose to produce ATP. All the cells in our body need energy to do something, whether it's to divide, to multiply, to repair, to make new proteins, whatever it is, every cell in our body needs constant, constant supply of ATP. And the most effective way to do that is to consume oxygen and break down glucose, which is a form of, it's a very simple carbohydrate, <clears throat> aerobically, because you have oxygen. And uh, we can do this anaerobically, but we produce a lot fewer ATP. So what are, we try to do is we breathe enough oxygen to break down our glucose and produce a ton of ATP. And then as a byproduct, we produce water as well as carbon dioxide. So all the cells in our body through this process of cellular respiration are actually telling our brain, so to speak, hey, we collectively need oxygen. So we want you to breathe it in. And then they also collectively say, hey, we have this waste product called carbon dioxide. We want you to get rid of it. And the way that we do that is by exhaling carbon dioxide. Now, the respiratory tract is called a tract because it's basically one continuous tube, although unlike the digestive system, it doesn't have a different entrance and exit. This basically, the entrance and exit are the same, which is your nose and your mouth, right? So what we do is in the upper respiratory tract, we have the nasal cavity, or just think about the nose, and then the mouth, and they converge at the pharynx, which is basically the throat. And then when we breathe, the epiglottis, which is that structure that closes when we're swallowing food, that stays open. So air goes through the, past that, down into the larynx. And the larynx is basically where our vocal cords are housed. We sometimes call it the voice box. And air rushes past that into what we call now the lower respiratory tract, which is the trachea. And if you put your hand in your throat, for the most part, if it's under the middle of it, or if you're a guy, it might be like an Adam's apple, underneath that point, it's essentially trachea. And that's a pretty um, tough tube that, tries, that stays open all the time, unlike your esophagus, which kind of closes when you're not swallowing. The trachea stays open, air rushes down through there, and then it branches, the trachea branches off into primary uh, bronchi. And a bronchi is basically a tube that connects each lung to the trachea. And we have two lungs, so we have two primary bronchi, a left and a right. And those bronchi branch off into secondary and tertiary bronchi, which just means they get more and more, like they get smaller, essentially, so they can spread out. And then bronchi, they all get smaller into bronchioles, just like our arteries go into arterioles as they get smaller towards capillaries, and our venules uh, turn into veins as they come back towards the heart, okay? And then they all end in what we call alveoli. And those are the site of gas exchange, okay? And alveoli is pretty much what makes up the lung tissue. Now, if you think about this, I've just described sort of an upside down tree, right? So starting off with the, the trunk of the tree is kind of like your trachea. And then as it goes lower and lower, it branches more and more and more. So it's kind of like an upside down tree. If you imagine the tree would be like the trunk and then it goes up into the smaller and smaller branches that branch off into tiny branches. And then let's say it's an apple tree. It ends with a little fruit, the apple, the very end points. And that's kind of like your alveoli, okay? Now, if you look at lung tissue itself, each lung is primarily made of alveoli because that is that is the purpose of lungs is to be able to exchange gas. So surrounding all these 300 million capillary in each lung, sometimes a little bit more, are a bunch of capillaries. Yeah, did I just say the alveoli? Yeah, whatever the capillaries are surrounding the alveoli, or you could say that you know the alveoli is around the capillaries. Either way, they're basically closely connected. There's just one cell of uh, simple epithelium, simple squamous epithelium, um, that makes up the alveoli. So it's really easy for the air that came all the way down in from your lungs or from your you know from your bronchioles down into the alveoli to diffuse easily across into the capillaries to let oxygen go into the blood and then let carbon dioxide come back out of the blood. So this is the site of gas exchange, okay? And if you look at this picture on the right side, lungs, the right lung is three lobes and the left has two. And that's because right here on the left side is where the heart sits. So there needs to be space for the heart.
Okay. Surfactant is this liquid that coats the inside of the alveoli. That way there's no surf, there's there's no basically water kind of surface tension or pressure that keep that would keep them closed, essentially, right? When we inhale, air rushes in and inflates them. And we don't want any water that's going to sort of want to keep them sticky. Now, what's protecting the respiratory tract is something called the respiratory epithelium. And this is pretty cool. Basically, from the nose all the way into the bronchi, we have specialized epithelium, which is pseudostratified columnar epithelium that has a couple of interesting things. Goblet cells, which are interspersed into here, that produce mucus. Okay, and then the tissue is also ciliated and cilia are these little tiny hairs. So those things work together. What happens is when something that shouldn't be uh, inhaled actually gets inhaled, hopefully gets stuck in the mucus. And then the, the cilia whisk things upwards back towards our mouth, right? So you've probably done this before where you, <clears throat> you have something in your throat or maybe even feels lower and you cough it up. Right? So what you're doing is something is trapped somewhere in your respiratory system and you are coughing up the mucus and then the cilia is whisking it up to your mouth. And then from that point, you either spit it out of your body or you swallow it and it goes down your esophagus into your stomach. And if you remember, your stomach is very acidic and it will kill most anything. Now, ventilation, how we actually bring air in and how we push it out. I think it's fascinating and it's really understandable when you look at it from a sort of uh, not really from the lungs concept until you understand it from like the basic chemistry or physics concept. So ventilation, again, is the process of moving air in and out of the lungs. This has nothing to do with perfusing that oxygen or carbon dioxide through the blood. This is just moving air in and out of the lungs, okay? So volume and pressure are really what dictate this, okay? So volume is the space that you've got to work with, and the pressure is how often or how frequent all the little particles inside of that space are bumping into each other and bumping into the walls, okay? So let's look at these two different cups right here. They're basically it's the same cup, but what happened is is somebody's pushed down the lid of it further in this one. So let's look on the left, right? In here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, about 13 little dots. And those are supposed to signify molecules of gas, right? So in the air we breathe around us, again, there's things like oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen. We collectively call it air, but there's a bunch of different types of gas molecules that are floating around in there. So if you trap some of these 13 in there, there's a total amount of volume, and that is the space that they get to bounce around, okay? Now, if all of a sudden you push the, the lid of it down and you decrease the space, or, or it's technically called the volume, in which those same 13 molecules of gas get to bounce around, they're going to bounce around at a higher rate. It's gonna be more pressure. You've actually, by decreasing the volume of the space, you've increased the pressure of the molecules inside of the space. And we know that because now all these molecules, they have to bump into each other more frequently. They bump into the walls more frequently, right? If you had your hand on top of this, you might actually feel more pressure, more resistance for this to come back up because all of these are pressing so much against the surface or against the lid of it. So as a principle, as volume decreases, pressure increases, okay? So let's think about that with the lungs, okay? Now, when we breathe, we, I don't know whether you realize, realize this or not, our, when we inhale, our diaphragm, which is this muscle that separates the thoracic cavity, which is the chest, and from the abdominal cavity, which is basically the abdomen, which is below the, kind of the rib cage, but the diaphragm is essentially what separates those two, okay? When we breathe in, we inhale, the diaphragm contracts, it flattens out. And by flattening out, it actually increases the space in our thoracic cavity, in our chest. So the volume increases, okay? When that volume increases, remember we said volume and pressure, they do the opposites. So when the volume increases, the pressure inside of our thoracic cavity decreases. Now, stay with me here. The air outside of our body, there's a certain amount of pressure of all the different gases, right? 
things want to move from areas of higher concentration to areas of lower concentration. So all the different particles outside of our body say, hey, there is a lot less pressure inside of this region right now. And so they go down their concentration gradient and they go in through the nose and mouth and they fill up the lungs basically. And then when we exhale, the diaphragm relaxes and then comes back up, basically it comes back to its cone shape and that decreases the volume in our chest. And again, as volume decreases, pressure increases, just like you saw over here in this picture. So what happens is now all those little molecules of gas that are inside of your lungs, they say, hey, there's too much pressure. There's not enough space inside of here, but there's less pressure outside of this person. So let's just go again down our concentration gradient and leave the body and go outside into the air. So really it's pressure and volume that dictate moving air inside and out of our lungs. Now, when we inhale, again, the diaphragm flattens. And you can see basically, this is a picture of that diaphragm right here underneath the ribs, okay? And it would be basically underneath here. Now the scalenes, and here's a picture right here, the scalenes and the external intercostals are other muscles and collectively the diaphragm, scalenes and external intercostals are called muscles of inhalation. When we want to basically take a big breath in, we want to expand our thoracic cavity, they all aid in that process. And by doing that, then air rushes in because pressure is lower. And then pressure finally equalizes once we have a full breath, right then, okay, it's equal with outside. And then as we start to exhale, now the pressure increases, so air escapes. And that is during exhalation. So that is, for the most part, exhalation is a pretty uh, passive process, okay? We don't have to try unless we're really huffing and puffing to get air out of us. And it's because um, the lungs are kind of like a balloon. They like to naturally recoil when you don't put pressure in them, right? And so with that, you don't need as many muscles, right? We have our internal intercostal muscles that help depress and push things down, push their ribs back down. But for the most part, exhalation is a pretty passive process. Now we move into gas exchange. So we've talked about ventilation. Now let's talk about perfusion. And another name for perfusion is gas exchange, okay? Exchanging gases throughout the body. Now, imagine right up here, this is uh, basically the alveoli, one alveoli, and right next to it is a capillary, and this is in the lungs. And as I said, there's just basically one cell thick of epithelial cells that make up an alveoli. And then the same with a capillary, you've got one endothelial cell, okay? So what's happening is, is that, again, it's about pressure, pressure gradients. Now, when you see these, these terms PCO2 and PO2, don't get too worried about that. What that's saying is the pressure of carbon dioxide and the pressure of oxygen, right? If there's a lot of oxygen molecules in one area, the pressure of them is gonna be higher. So this number is gonna be higher. But if there's less of those in there, the pressure is gonna be lower. So this number is gonna be lower. And things always wanna to move to areas of lower pressure or lower concentration. So with that in mind, starting off oxygen. In the alveoli, we have the pressure of oxygen is 104 millimeters of mercury. In the capillary, the pressure of oxygen is 40 millimeters of mercury, much less. So what happens is naturally oxygen diffuses to an area of lower concentration, which is in the capillary. Once it's in there, it gets sucked out and then moved throughout the body. When it comes back, you're going to see this exact opposite thing. Okay? Carbon dioxide is what's the byproduct of cellular respiration. So carbon dioxide is gonna come back in from the heart, from the vena cava to the heart and then to the lungs. And we wanna get rid of it. So here we see that the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the capillaries is 45 millimeters of mercury. Whereas the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the alveoli is 40 and 45 is greater than 40. So carbon dioxide, again, wants to easily diffuse down its concentration gradient from the blood into the lungs. So really this basic concept of things moving passively, passive diffusion from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration really is sort of behind both ventilation and perfusion.
okay? Now, if you don't remember us from the cardiovascular system, how exactly are these oxygen molecules getting around the blood? Well, it's not just freely floating in the blood. Some carbon dioxide is, a little bit of oxygen, but for the most part, it's through red blood cells that contain hemoglobin. And hemoglobin are the molecules that are actually binding oxygen molecules and then transferring those all throughout the blood. So from a bigger picture here, you have the alveoli and you got a high pressure of that oxygen and then it diffuses into an area of lower pressure, which again is a red blood cell. You've got these um, oxygen molecules and it's signifying an oxygen molecule and it's taking that around the left side of the heart. It's going to pump it through the body and then it gets to some cell of the body. It doesn't matter where. And when it gets to a cell, again, the cell, because it's constantly using oxygen and getting rid of it, creating carbon dioxide, there's never a lot of oxygen in a cell because it keeps using it up. Like a car that's always driving, it's burning through its gasoline, so it constantly needs more. So as soon as oxygen gets around that cell in a capillary nearby, oxygen again moves down its concentration gradient into a cell. And then kind of a similar thing, um, now that it's got lower, lower, basically the concentration of oxygen, once it's all been taken up by a cell, and I should say this, blood that gets back to the heart from the vena cava in the vein, the venous system, is not totally empty of oxygen. There's still some bound to the hemoglobin, just a lot less. Okay, so when that blood gets back to the lungs, it's got a lot lower pressure of oxygen. And so now more oxygen from our alveoli come down into it, keep on diffusing into it. So how about carbon dioxide? Well, carbon dioxide is constantly being built up inside of cells that are using oxygen to create ATP. So we have to get rid of it too. So we actually have a very important way of getting rid of it because believe it or not, carbon dioxide when it builds up, it can actually become, uh, it can create an acidic environment, okay? If you hold your breath and you don't breathe and you're not getting rid of carbon dioxide, your blood becomes acidic. So we have different ways to get rid of carbon dioxide. One, carbon dioxide can just bind to some hemoglobin and get rid of it. Some of it can be dissolved in the plasma, but we have a very, very important, most of our carbon dioxide, the way we get rid of it is through something called the bicarbonate buffering system. So what happens is, is that we freely have water as part of the plasma of our blood. So carbon dioxide can bind with water and be rearranged to form something called carbonic acid, okay? And again, this can disassociate, which means it breaks apart again, and it can become something called bicarbonate, which is a base, or just acid, which is an acid. So if the environment is very acidic, it can basically become a buffer and make it less acidic. If it's too basic, it can bind and make it more, again, more neutral. What's happening though is, is the big takeaway is that when we build up carbon dioxide, it has the potential to make the body too acidic. So we can use a respiratory system to actually rearrange the way that we are holding on to that hydrogen, which is causing acidity, and we can breathe it out. We can breathe it out as carbon dioxide. We'll learn in the urinary system that you can actually use the, uh, the kidneys and the urinary system with the respiratory system to maintain homeostasis in pH. We call it metabolic and renal mechanisms, okay? You can have acidosis or alkalosis, and you can have them either respiratory or metabolic, and metabolic is the, the, the renal, and that's when we talk about the urinary system. Okay. And the last slide here, we have chemical control of breathing. And this sort of piggybacks on the last slide. So if you hold your breath and you don't get rid of carbon dioxide, that is actually what's going to make you breathe. When you hold your breath, it's not that you don't have enough oxygen, it's that you have too much carbon dioxide. Because acutely, what's happening right now is that because you're not breathing out carbon dioxide, your blood got acidic. And your brain detected that very quickly. And it did that by getting signals from things called chemoreceptors that are located in things like uh, your carotid bodies, so in your carotid arteries, and then also in the arch of your aorta, so blood that's just leaving your heart, freshly oxygenated blood, that are constantly, these chemoreceptors are like little tongues that are constantly tasting the blood. And they're saying, we know what the pH should be. And if it's too acidic, 
because you've been holding in your breath and you're not breathing out, then we're going to send a signal to your brain and your brain in the region called the medulla oblongata, which is basically the base of your, of your uh, brain stem. It's a, that's a part of your brain that's all about just keeping you alive, that you don't even have to think about stuff. And then the medulla oblongata, that will then signal in a respiratory center that it has inside of there that dictates how often and how deeply you breathe. It will manually override your breathing and it'll make you breathe to, make, to restore homeostasis. So for instance, if the acidity is too high, if it's too acidic, because you're not getting rid of enough carbon dioxide or you have a low oxygen and it is a sort of, those are like two sides of the same coin, so to speak, then it's going to make you breathe more. So you could get rid of carbon dioxide. And the opposite is true as well. If the, the brain senses that you're too basic, the blood is too basic, it's not acidic enough. And that's because you're, you don't have enough carbon dioxide or you have too much oxygen, it's going to make you breathe less. Now, the way I've always thought about this and it, it immediately makes sense is I love to exercise. Let's say that you're sprinting and you notice that you're really having a huff and puff. And it's because, you know, like your legs are burning because you're running or something like that. You're breathing so much, not because you necessarily need that much oxygen, I mean, you do, but what's immediately making you breathe so much more, so much rapidly is you need to get rid of carbon dioxide. And you might notice that your instinct is yes to inhale, but also you're really trying to force air out. And maybe the next time, if you don't realize this already, if you're in a situation like this, try to force air out as much as you can and see if that makes you actually feel a bit better. Because it might just be that your blood is becoming too acidic because your muscles are having to work anaerobically, right? And they're producing a lot of carbon dioxide as a byproduct. And your body, your respiratory system is trying to compensate by breathing off carbon dioxide. Okay, that's my spiel there. I hope that you enjoyed this. I hope this was helpful. Um, and please email me with any questions. And I look forward to talking to you all soon. Bye.